Okay. Well, during the break, um, I had a couple of requests to mention a few things. One is a, a matter of housekeeping, and that is, for those of you who are visiting with us, and when I say that, I mean not, not indigenous TI people here, okay, but customers who have come in. They've requested that you keep your badge. And, and I feel bad about this because last night I gave a visitor the wrong instructions. I said, just drop your badge off at the, <laughs> at the gate. Not supposed to do that. They want you to keep your badges for the entire duration of this, and then you can turn them in at the end of uh, the day tomorrow. So if you've got a badge right now, security badge, just go ahead and keep it, and be sure to bring it tomorrow morning because I guess there were a few people who didn't, and as a result of that, they had to contact Rich Templeton, and he had to okay it and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, try to remember to bring your badge. Uh, second thing is somebody asked the question about saliency. That's one of those terms that we just kind of throw around because it sounds impressive and we just assume that other people know what we're talking about. Well, so what, what is saliency? Well, basically it's a measure of the magnetic roundness of a motor. So if a motor has the same inductance on the d-axis that it has on the q-axis, we say that that has zero saliency. In other words, it's perfectly magnetically round. If a motor has a shape which is going to cause different inductances on the D and the Q axes, like the IPM motor that I showed, for example, I mean, literally, saliency is LD minus LQ. Or maybe it's LQ minus, I can't remember, but it's the difference between those two inductances. And what causes that difference in inductances? It's protruding pieces either on the rotor or the stator that cause that to happen. So if you look at a, a rotor, it has a bunch of spokes that come out of it, you know, uh, that's not, you know, just a round piece of steel. If it's got protruding spokes, that's going to probably result in high saliency. Um, or if you've got a stator structure where you have these poles that come down, in many cases, uh, that will result in high saliency. Um, but again, it's, it's something that's usually caused by variations in the air gap. As the motor is spinning, you get these places where the air gap is either bigger or smaller and that will cause uh, this difference in inductance between LD and L LQ, okay? But technically, it's LD minus LQ. That, that is, that's saliency. All right. Um, other than that, um, I'm back on my own computer now, so keep your fingers crossed and pray that this thing is going to make it through because there's a couple of, simula or a couple of, um, of uh, demos that I want to do with that. The one thing that I'd like to talk about, kind of to finish up my part of the presentation today, is a new sensorless technique that TI has developed over the last couple of years called InstaSpin FOC. Now, um, if you're not familiar with how we do things at TI, we come up with names designed to try to get the most confusion out of our customer base. So it was decided by our marketing department that anything that's related to motor control that's coming out of the groups anymore should be called InstaSpin. So we have InstaSpin VLDC, we have InstaSpin Motion, we have InstaSpin FOC, I think there's a couple of other InstaSpins that we're thinking about. So now when you, if you're a salesperson and you go to the customer and he says, I want to use InstaSpin, you have to say, which version of InstaSpin are you talking about? At which point he'll say, I don't have a clue, I just heard something about InstaSpin and I want to get it. All right, so make sure when we're talking about InstaSpin that we know what the suffix is at the end. That's really all that matters. InstaSpin is just a marketing thing that sounds cool. It's the suffix at the end that tells us what we're talking about here. Uh, FOC obviously stands for Field Oriented Control. And so what we're talking about is a new technology to do sensorless field oriented control. Um, let me uh, get my thing plugged in here. So let's, let's take a look at the history of sensorless algorithms as they apply to motor control systems. And this is kind of my swag at it here. If you look at the timeline starting in the late 70s all the way up to present day, you see that sensorless control actually goes back for, gosh, you know, more than 30 years, um, starting off with just sensorless commutation on brushless DC machines, where people realize that they could use the back EMF signal, look at the back EMF signal on the undriven coil of a brushless DC motor to get information about where the rotor uh, position was. Uh, then we have, uh, early in the, the 80s, we had linear observers, which are kind of like the one that I showed you with the um, uh, AC induction motor, uh, back EMF observers. And then, starting in about the mid-90s, we started to see a lot of effort going into sliding mode observers, 
DTC from ABB was coming on strong. And again, these are not when these techniques were invented. I mean, sliding mode observers have been around since I think the 40s or maybe even earlier than that. But it wasn't until I would say the late 90s that they really started making an impact or making inroads into the motor control world. So most recently, and this of course comes from a lot of work that was done out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and this is, I think it's safe to say, is Bob Lorenz's baby, uh, is saliency tracking, which is, again, if you have uh, a system like that that has saliency, like we talked about earlier, then you can actually measure the degree of that magnetic uh, non-roundness, if you will, to determine exactly where the rotor is positioned. But as of March of last year, we introduced a new observer topology um, called InstaSpin FOC, which we believe has a lot of advantages compared to some of the previous topologies. It's not strictly a back EMF observer. It's not a saliency. It, in fact, it, if you look at the history here, it's really not like any of these techniques, uh, which makes it kind of hard to classify. Um, this is essentially what we're talking about here. InstaSpin FOC is an algorithm. It's actually instantiated in ROM on certain parts that we make. And if you look at the parts, these are parts that either have an M suffix or an F suffix. Uh, M meaning InstaSpin motion or F meaning uh, InstaSpin fast. We'll get to what fast is in just a minute. But you get the right part with the right suffix and inside the ROM, just like we have in our IQ math library and, and other things that we have in ROM, we now have this neat little um, um, observer, if you will, that can do sensorless field-oriented control. What is, I think, well, there's several things that are unique about this algorithm, but here's one that I find to be absolutely fascinating. It is a unified observer, which takes advantage of the commonality in the stator circuits of just about every motor that's out there. What do I mean by that? Well, by using that commonality between all these different motor types, we can do FOC on all these different types of motors. We've already accomplished it with BLDC motors, AC induction motors, permanent magnet synchronous motors, field-oriented, I mean IPM motors. Uh, we have even on the bench demonstrated field-oriented control with a stepper motor. This is not ready to be productized yet, obviously, but it is something that we did. We kind of gasped when it happened. We said, hey, this could really change things in the stepper world. So that's something that we're right now studying to see how repeatable it is and what is going to be necessary to productize that. Even switch reluctance motors. Um, one of the people that we've been working with on this algorithm is absolutely convinced that this technique can work with switch reluctance motors. Uh, I mentioned that just to, you know, to say that it's under study. Um, we'll be, you know, making an announcement uh, if it does work, hopefully within the next year or two. But also, just to also point out the fact that this is, this is the list of all the different motor topologies that we have today that can work with that same algorithm. And it's the fact that it, it, is, it is such a, I don't know how else to say it, except that it is a unified model of how the stator circuit exists and how it works in, in most systems. Well. What is InstaSpin FOC? If you lift up the hood, this is what you're going to see. It's actually kind of a conglomeration of three different algorithms. The most important one is the observer itself. Now, this is called FAST, and we'll talk about what that F-A-S-T stands for in just a second. But this is the piece right here that actually enables the whole thing to do sensorless field-oriented control. The output of the FAST uh, module it gives us things like you know, the motor's flux, the motor speed, the motor angle. Obviously, that's the most important piece of it. All the things, all the signals necessary to, uh, to do field-oriented control by simply looking at the motor's voltages and currents. All right? We, ha we, we also have another, <clears throat> excuse me, we have another piece of this called motor ID. And what this does is actually an algorithm that actually incorporates the observer which goes out and it interrogates your motor. And it runs it through a little dance and it does a few things and then it comes back and says, okay, here are your parameters for your motor. We believe we know enough about your motor now that we can drop these into the fast observer and, and do field-oriented control with it. That piece of it is challenging, to say the least, because to try to get that to work seamlessly with every motor topology and every weird variation of every motor that ever existed is obviously something that uh, 
it, it's taken a lot of effort. We've got it where it works really good on what I'll call the uh, generic motors that are kind of under the bell curve, you know, in the center of the bell curve for each type. Works great. It's the ones where we're out on the tails now that we're trying to make this algorithm uh, to be able to lock onto those. Yes? When, okay, so the question is, when you run this auto ID, is it under no load, uh, or can it be used in the application itself? Uh, the answer is, um, we prefer to have it under no load, because that's when we get the best results. But under certain conditions, we've already, with some customers, demonstrated that with their loads, we can use it as well. And with AC induction motors, it's actually a two-part test. Uh, one running under hopefully no load, but the other part is a locked rotor test. So you'd have to do some kind of locked rotor on your bench. Once you get these parameters, though, for a particular motor type, a model of a particular motor, you don't have to run it again, though. So um, you only have to do the auto ID if it's a completely foreign motor to InstaSpin FOC. Once it's identified it, it actually saves the parameters in memory, in flash, so that the next time you start up the processor, you know, if you don't want to go through that whole ID process, you don't have to. You can just immediately start doing field-oriented control. The last piece of this is called power warp. What this really is, it's, it's kind of related to the other two, but it's almost like a, a spare appendix in some respects, in that it's got a very specific mission in terms of what it does. This algorithm is designed to dramatically increase the efficiency of AC induction motors under light loads. And I'll tell you a little bit about the history of that in the, you know, in the next coming up slides. But uh, this technique actually is based upon an algorithm which is centered on minimizing the copper losses in your rotor and your stator. And what we have found is if you use that algorithm versus maximum torque per amp or any number of a diff any of a different number of algorithms, it does seem to correlate very well with the maximum efficiency, especially when you consider your core losses and other aspects of the machine. So minimizing your I2R losses uh, seems to be the way to go, and I'll show some examples of that. Okay, let's start with motor identification. Um, when I first did this slide, we obviously, we, we obviously were very optimistic as to how successful this would be. In fact, we went as far as to say no data sheet required. And I think in 80-some percent of the cases, that's still true. It's those weird motors that we're still you know, learning how to deal with that, in fact, we do have to get some help from the data sheet. But in most cases, if you're talking about a permanent magnet machine, for example, all you need to give it is the current rating from the user in most cases, and the motor ID will take care of the rest. For AC induction motor operation, we need a few more things. We need to know the rated current the rated voltage, and the rated frequency. And then we feed that to this auto ID algorithm. It can go out. I mean, because you have to know how to stimulate the motor to get the signals, how to exercise it. You would not stimulate a little um, Anaheim automation motor that's the size of my hand the same way you would a 1,000 horsepower AC induction motor. So I mean, we need to know something about the motor. And these are just the bare basic parameters that you need to provide to the algorithm. Um, all of the offset correction is done for you automatically for the voltages and currents. Um, automatic current loop tuning. Remember I said if you use that e expression this morning where you set your Ka and Kb terms in accordance with what the R and the L values are? Well, it does that automatically because it goes out and calculates what R and L for your motor are. So then it actually figures those out for you as well. Now this algorithm, the one thing that it is very sensitive to is knowing what the stator resistance is, all right? And not, that's not atypical of a lot of centerless algorithms, but I mean, every observer or every centerless algorithm, the sensitivity to parameter error is, is a problem that you have to deal with because all this nice stuff that I showed you up here assumes that your observer really does know what the resistance is or it really knows what the inductance is. In a lot of cases, you don't. You make your best guess, and then if you're wrong, then you start seeing some drifting in the angle accuracy. Well, it just so happens that um, uh, InstaSpin FOC really, really needs to know what that stator resistance is. To help us to accommodate that, we actually have a stator resistance observer that's running in real time in the background. And what it's doing is it's, it's stimulating the uh, D-axis, because that doesn't produce any torque, but it's stimulating the D-axis in such a way that it's actually going out and making active 
resistance measurements of the motor in real time. So as the motor starts heating up, like in many cases we've seen, you know, like washing machine motors under heavy load, their stator resistance can change by a factor of three. And, uh, you know, when it gets really hot to the point where you can actually look at the motor and see it shimmering because heat waves are being, <laughs> are coming off that thing. All right, so in those cases, we really want to track what the rotor resistance is, and this is just a, yet another tool which helps us to get much better angle accuracy out of InstaSpin FOC over the entire operating range. Let's shift our discussion now to the FAST observer. And you can see why we call it FAST. It's actually an acronym that stands for flux, angle, speed, and torque. And not only do we get those out of it, but we also get like what is the estimate uh, of the ID and the IQ, which you can then feed into your um, field oriented control loop as shown up here. Now, InstaSpin FOC is not this whole piece of it. That's one thing I think that confuses some people. We provide a reference design which has all the Clark and Park transforms on it and everything else. That's not InstaSpin FOC, that's MotorWare. MotorWare includes all these libraries to do all this stuff which also accommodates InstaSpin FOC, which is the th these three pieces right here. So you use InstaSpin FOC in a more uh, complete example, which you would find in MotorWare. Does that make sense? Okay, hopefully it does. But anyway, what we need to provide to the fast observer is we need to have samples of the motor phase voltages, samples of the currents. What we're going to do in order to provide um, feedback of what the phase voltages are, we can't just provide the PWM signals into the A to D converter. What we do is we filter them first, and then we provide the filtered versions of those phase voltages to the algorithm. We also then need to know what the RC, time, the RC time constant is of that filter so that we can actually correct for any phase delay that's associated with that filter. The goal being that we want to actually reconstruct those phase voltages as accurately as we can. We obviously need to know the motor type, and then also the motor ID values which come from the auto ID routine. <coughs> Once you provide those pieces of information, then this is the stuff that FAST can provide on the output. Now, one of the things that we're actually talking about is going from FAST to FEAST. And what I mean by that is we have F-E-A-S-T, because one of the signals that this thing is capable of providing, which we don't bring out right now, is back EMF. So once we got the back EMF signals, this really does help us in terms of designing some of the other pieces up here. Uh, for example, the field weakening algorithm, if you have back EMF information, that becomes a little bit simpler to do. But more importantly, you know that, that, um, that uh, uh, cross-coupling correction algorithm that we developed for the ID and IQ current regulators? We calculated that based upon um, what the stator circuit looked like, right? But what we didn't do is if you go in and do it for the, like an AC induction motor, it's a different compensation network. In fact, if you open up my simulation on that particular topic, you'll see that it selects the type of compensation based upon the type of motor that you're providing. Whether it's an IPM, permanent magnet synchronous motor, or AC induction motor, you kick in different algorithms because the cross-coupling terms will be different for those different types of motors. Well, the good news is if you have, and we've already gone through and proven this, if you have back EMF information for, you know, um, VD, uh, EMFD and EMFQ, you can design a compensation network that is also uh, uniform, that covers all motor types. And all you have to do then is just use that same compensation structure instead of having to kick in different structures that you have to do if you don't have the back EMF information. So, you know, there's various reasons why we're thinking about that, but something to keep your eye on is that, you know, there's a chance that very soon we're going to be introducing some more of those internal signals that are inside FAST and bringing them out for our customers to be able to use. Uh, this just is an example that was taken showing, uh, you know, angle accuracy at different speeds on a particular motor. I think this was the, uh, this, yeah, this was the Eston motor. This, in, this particular case is running at 75, 750 RPM under various torque load commands as shown here. And you can see that at 750 RPM, just as an example with a motor, uh, we can hold the angle error in terms of our estimation when compared to an actual encoder to be less than, what, about 0.7 degrees 
of accuracy. All right, which is pretty good. Now this is speed dependent, so if you start going at slower speeds, and this is 150 RPM for the same motor, um, yeah, then we do see that uh, the angle accuracy starts getting up closer to, on average, about what, plus or minus one degree in this case. But again, still very, very good. And we've actually used this motor, um, even though it is not a true zero speed observer, we can actually use this algorithm to go down to speeds that are incredibly low. In fact, I'll show a demonstration of that over here on my motor. Uh, in the area of um, 200, 300 millihertz under load, uh, we've actually been able to do sensorless control very, very, very nicely. Okay, but again, it depends on a lot of things, uh, especially, you know, the motor that you have. Let me show an example of this. Um, this is something that uh, one of my friends actually did in the lab when we were working on this. Um, where's my pointer? Here it is. Now this is taken on a, techni a Technic motor. And it just kind of shows, you know, under very, very low speeds. And this, I think, was around uh, 200, 300 millihertz. And this is done under sensorless control. You know, you can kind of see how slow we can make that motor spin. Obviously, it's no load. So, um, you know, it's not as impressive as if you had a big load on it. But you can kind of see down around at least 200 millihertz or 300 millihertz. Um, you know, those are the kinds of speeds that we can achieve on the motor. All right. Here's some supporting collateral that we have for InstaSpin FOC today. A lot of customers want to know, well, okay, how does it work? Can I try it out without actually having to get a development board and, you know, set something up in my lab? The answer is yes. Uh, we actually have a website where we have a simulation. In fact, it's some VisSim simulations that I created that exist on this website. You can actually select what kind of load you want. You can select from a list of motors. And what it'll do is under different load profiles, like this right here would be like, kind of like a punch press application, you can actually go through then and in some cases actually specify what your load profile will look like and run this simulation. It takes about four to five minutes. And then at that period of time, it spits out all these graphs which show angle error, uh, you know, torque, speed, all these different graphs to kind of give you an idea of how it works. So it's a way to kind of do a quick drive if you just want to take it out for a spin without investing a whole bunch of your time and a whole bunch of energy getting a development tool set up in your lab. Go up to the website, and it's, it's listed right there at the bottom. And you can fire it up and specify your motor parameters, or at least you know, select from a palette of different motors and different load applications and run it and get an idea of what it can do for you. Well, let's talk about the power warp part of this now. Um, one of the things that uh, people have been working on, gosh, this is from the late 70s even, is a way to make AC induction motors run more efficiently when they are lightly loaded. Uh, if you will recall, our AC motor stator current consists of two parts. It, in it includes a magnetizing current component and also a load current, which is quadrature to that. Okay, that's your torque current. Well, what happens when your torque current goes to zero or very close to zero? The fact is you haven't done anything to change the magnetizing part of your current. It's still at rated flux, rated current, and as a result of that, the motor tends to be very, very inefficient because it's not producing much torque, but it's still drinking a lot of magnetizing current. So there have been different ways, and this right here technique, which is based upon the old NOLA patent from NASA, would actually measure the zero crossings of the voltage waveform and the current waveform. And it would start to see when the power factor of the waveforms got bad, which was indicated by a separation of the times of the zero crossings between the voltage and the current, it would use a triac to start phasing down the voltage amplitude of the motor. Well, what they're really trying to do indirectly is to control the level of the motor flux. And that's what just about all these techniques are based on. When the motor is not being utilized heavily, then why have all that motor flux there? So they all tend to... Uh, try to scale down the, the, the level of the, uh, of the motor flux. This does it indirectly by controlling the voltage. Well, now that we're doing this with FOC, we can directly control the, the motor flux by the D-axis current. So we have something that does the, pretty much the same thing, with the exception, of course, that it's throttling back on the D-axis current, reducing the flux, and that has the same effect of pretty much putting the motor to sleep. 
which can be bad. And that's why, for example, if you put the motor to sleep, uh, you've reduced your flux. Let's say now all of a sudden you get this huge load um, step function where it needs to, do, to create lots of torque in order to keep the speed. Well, what is torque? Torque is the product of your IQ current times your rotor flux. Your rotor flux has been significantly reduced and it has a long time constant associated with it, like three to 500 milliseconds. So you can only put so much Q-axis current out there before you've reached the limit of your inverter. That means you're in trouble. In many cases, you can't get enough torque to meet the torque demand of a load, and the motor will stall. And in fact, there's nothing even with the power warp that's going to prevent that from happening. The difference is that if you do stall the motor, with all the older techniques, you have pretty much, uh, you either burn up your motor or you have to hit the reset button and start the whole thing over again. Uh, but with power warp, because we have the fast observer running concurrently to that, even if the motor speed is brought down to zero, um, we never lose control of where the angle is. And as a result of that, we can bring it back up gracefully to speed once the stall has occurred. There's nothing that can present, prevent the stall if you have defluxed your machine. So that's something to be careful of. And that's why a lot of people, if they're in situations where they can have unexpected torque perturbations, they'll just leave the flux on the machine set high so they can handle them. But in a lot of other applications where you have time to anticipate when you're going to need lots of torque, like for example an elevator application when it's just sitting there, why not deflux the motor? Because nothing's happening. And even if you get a bunch of people in there and you push the button, before you start moving you can still build the flux back up in your machine and then do the move. So in those kind of cases, this right here shows an example of how we can improve efficiently efficiency dramatically compared to not doing any kind of defluxing. This cyan colored line right here represents efficiency without any motor defluxing whatsoever. And you can see under light loaded conditions, the efficiency is going down into the tank somewhere around 15 to 25 percent. By turning power warp on, you can see we can hold efficiency much higher at even lower load ratings simply because we are defluxing the machine and we're defluxing the machine on an algorithm, using an algorithm that's based upon minimizing the I squared, I squared R losses like I talked about earlier. Let's compare that approach to some other approaches that are out there. This was actually field tested in an application. This was an agricultural application for air and humidity control. We benchmarked it against the traditional TRIAC drive. Uh, we benchmarked it against a standard variable frequency drive. And then we benchmarked it against an energy optimized drive, which was designed to increase efficiency, but it was based upon a different algorithm, perhaps maximum torque per amp, or trying to seek you know, some peak of another curve. Obviously, against the TRIAC drive, we blew it apart, almost twice the energy savings that we were able to achieve. Over a standard variable frequency drive, still very impressive performance, 70% of the energy versus um, you know, from one to the other. But here's the one that really impressed me. And this was from a very large uh, European, German drives manufacturer, which I, I'm not really supposed to say their name, but you probably can figure out who they are. Um, they had a drive that was actually optimized to do this same kind of thing, to save energy on AC induction machines. And even against that, we were able to get 28% better efficiency performance out of that algorithm uh, than what they were capable of. So, I'm not sure if this is something that would be of interest to you, if anybody's doing anything with AC induction motors. This technique only works with AC induction motors, okay? But if you do stuff with uh, AC induction motors and you have an application where the motor is sitting idle for a long period of time, uh, this might be of, uh, be of some interest to you. Well, let's talk about the software a little bit. Now, some of the guys in the middle back there are going to start laughing at me because I consider myself to be a hardware engineer. And every time, you know, the word software comes up, I usually run to the phone and ask for one of my friends to help me out with this, okay? So uh, I'm going to try to talk about software from the hardware perspective, which will probably, make, will probably be somewhat nauseating to some of you, but hopefully uh, others will be able to understand exactly where I'm coming from. Um, one of the things that, well, let's take a look at this. This right here just kind of shows how we've implemented um, InstaSpin FOC. Now we have, in ROM, we have the observer, which is the fast observer, and then we also have examples of the speed PI loop, the current regulators, the reverse park transform, all those kind of things, which I guess I don't really consider to be part of InstaSpin FOC, but they are in ROM. So we do have examples of that. 
So in one, inst in one envisionment of how you would actually use this, you would enter an interrupt service routine. All you'd have to do is read your phase voltages and read your phase currents, pass those over to the observer, and then tell the observer from that point on, calculate everything for me, and all I need to know is what is the values of VU, VV, and VW that I'm supposed to drop into the PWM module. All right? And so this, in this case right here, the user has really very little interaction with the process at all. Uh, and this would be for examples where people, they say, okay, I need to make my motor spin, but I really don't like motor control. I don't want to touch it any more than I have to. TI, you just do the whole thing for me. Well, we can. This is right here an example of that. Um, but there's other examples where, you know, you're, you're dealing with some customers that maybe they have their own special little blend of herbs and spices that they like to drop into some of these components right here in terms of how they clamp the integrators or whatever they do. Uh, for those people, we actually provide another uh, implementation model. Um, it's actually not shown here. It's actually in the next slide. There we go. Where all you have to use, if you want to, is just the fast observer in ROM, but then all this other stuff out here is in flash or in RAM. So again, if, if you're a customer that prefers to kind of roll up your shirt sleeves and do your own PI control loops and your own Clark Park transformers, or you have a special way to do it that maybe you've patented, fine. Well, you can still do that. You can still implement your piece of your IP that you consider to be proprietary, and then also use FAST or use InstaSpin to be compatible with that. <clears throat> now, all of this stuff is currently accessible through something we call motorware. And really, when you look at it, motorware is really nothing more than just a, a, a collection of folders and links to um, a directory structure. Instead of, um, I actually put a bunch of slides together to show this, but I think maybe it would be more instructive to just show it to you. Because um, I've got motorware installed on my system here. Um, let me show you how this works. Now, this is a free download from Texas Instruments. You can actually go up on our site. If you type in motorware, it'll take you right to this, um, right to this location. Let me move this down here a little bit. Here it is. Now, this is Motorware 11, so this is the latest one. There we go. Oh, I hear my fan speeding up. It sounds like my computer is going to overheat here again pretty soon. Keep your fingers crossed. So, this, this is what it is, actually. And, and you can let me turn this up a little bit. You have all these different uh, folders that you can go into. Right now, it includes InstaSpin FOC, InstaSpin Motion different drivers, modules, resources, and then, of course, links to uh, Code Composer Studio. Well, I'm interested in InstaSpin FOC, so I'm going to click on that. Um, we actually right now have it in the O2X family, and we also have it in the O6X family. The 6X instantiation is, is more mature. I'm going to actually open that up, and that gives me more options. So you see I keep drilling down into this structure right here. This gives me a GUI interface option, and then I also have three different options of hardware that I can use, the DRV8312, the 8301, or the high voltage kit. I'll just pick the 8312. Uh, example projects, um, the documentation for all the projects. Now this is interesting. This is all done with Doxygen. Uh, this is new to me. I'm not used to Doxygen. For those of you who have lived your whole life by it, I guess you're kind of used to this, but I thought it was kind of neat. It provides really a nice way to, uh, to document your code instead of the little hashtag, hashtag, or the you know, um, backslash, backslash technique. You can actually now use an HTML structure to get some really neat things out of this. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So, for example, the modules. Um, we have user modules, control modules. We also have all the projects for this, which you can open up. But let me just go to, like, the, um, let's say the control modules. This right here shows all of the different control modules that are used in InstaSpin FOC. It's quite a long list of them. We have uh, modules that do everything. Modules that call modules that do, I mean, just anything you can, you know, to set a bit somewhere in a register, you never set the bit. You call a module or a routine that actually does that for you. Um, but then, here's what I'm going to show you. You get down to the part, and this is where the, you know, you can see kind of the HTML description of that. Each one of these routines, you know, it's got, it tells you what the inputs, what the outputs are, what the parameters are, what, uh, you know, is passed to it, what you get back from it. 
Um, you know what kind of handles it uses for every one of the modules. If you want to look at the, um, let me go back here, data structures. Uh, that wasn't actually the one I wanted. Let me see if I can find this. Here we go. Uh, okay. Um, here we go. User. That's what I was looking for. So this right here defines all of the different uh, user variables that you can set. System frequency, you know, how many sensors, how many uh, current sensors you have, what is the PWM period, all these different variables that are used that you know, need to be specified or can be used in conjunction with InstaSpin FOC. And again, when you look at the Doxygen part of that, you know, all, of the, uh, all of the documentation is printed out here as well. So it's really a nice collection of um, not only the, the, the modules, the data structures, um, but also all the documentation. If you want to go down to, um, where is it, resources here, you can go drill down once again into your particular setup, um, 069, and you can get all these PDFs about how to use the kits, how to use the GUI interfaces, the GUIs, how you install them, how you interface with it. I mean, like I said, I don't consider myself to be a software guy at all, but I was on the first try able to get the GUI up and running and talking to the software and, you know, doing nice, neat little things with it uh, without any trouble whatsoever, just by simply following the step-by-step -step instructions that are included here under the Resources tab. So that's what MotorWare is. It, MotorWare itself is really just a collection of, um, of all these different pieces of information. Uh, oops, wait a minute. Let me get back over to, to here. There we go. Now, one of the things that's also different, besides just the structure, you know, of how we, um, you know, that, that motorware is, is just a collection of these uh, pieces of information, it also represents a different way of coding. It's a very structured, very object-oriented way of interfacing with the FAST modules, uh, the FAST algorithm. And there's also, as part of the, uh, the MotorWare uh, folder structure, there's a document in there which describes exactly what is expected of you from a structural point of view, if you're writing C code, how you interface to our structures and you know, try to maintain that structure that we use to be compatible uh, in your code. I mean, obviously you can write any kind of code you want to, but for maximum effectiveness, we go through and explain exactly what structure we used, why we used it, why the object-oriented approach seems to be the, the right way to handle this, and just kind of an encouragement to you to try to keep in line with that same structure in order to in interface with it. But another thing that's different is um, instead of using uh, macros, we actually use inline C. Now, the way that a lot of stuff was done with Control Suite was a lot of things were done with macros. And that was, you know, you just basically you invoke a, a certain um, function or whatever, and it just pulls up a macro and just inserts it, you know, right in there uh, to be equivalent to that. We've actually gone with an inline approach, which uh, one of the advantages that it gives us is not only the inherent speed improvement that you see compared to using macros, but uh, another advantage is if you're debugging inline code versus macro code, if you hit a macro and you try to do like a single step through it or something, you're just it's not going to be able to do that. With inline code, you can actually hit an inline structure and you can actually single step through it. So it makes it also very easy to debug if you're trying to you know, figure out what's going on with something in your algorithm. Okay, so I think you know, pretty much you get the idea of what I'm talking about, or at least hopefully you do. Let me, uh, let me put this in presentation mode here. So that's kind of what it is. I've got a demo of it here just in a second, but before we do that, I know Richard, he likes to, at the end of every section, he has one of these quizzes. So I'm going to ask you a couple questions now about InstaSpin, FOC, and uh, see, if you can, uh, see if you can get these right. First of all, question number one. What are the three sub-modules of InstaSpin FOC? The what? Motor ID, Power Warp Technology, and the Fast Observer. Excellent. All right. List at least three types of motors that InstaSpin FOC can control. AC induction, BLDC, 
PMSM, right. And also IPM, stepper motor, and hopefully someday switch reluctance. We'll see. What component of InstaSpend FOC results in energy savings with AC induction motors? Power warp, exactly. List at least five system A to D, A to C, ADC measurements that are required by FAST. What's that? Current, so there's two currents that we need at least, and three voltages. Okay, good enough. We also measure the bus voltage and do that feed forward technique that I was talking about this morning to actually compensate for variations in your bus voltage. List the four outputs of the FAST observer. Flux, angle, speed, torque. It, it's kind of corny, but it does make it easy to remember, doesn't it? You can just kind of rattle them off then. All right. How are FAST-enabled processors distinguished from non-FAST devices? F or M in the suffix of the part number itself. Exactly. True or false, motorware uses macros instead of online code to enable easier debugging. False. That's the one we just talked about, so hopefully you would have got that one. And last, list at least two development boards for use with InstaSpin software. Didn't get into that. <laughs> that hasn't made my slide set yet. That's the latest one that's available. Yes, you're right. InstaSpin Launchpad. I've got a question. Yes. Is, um, is this stuff only available rommed into specific processes, processes that, uh, um, that support it? Or is this IP available for ROMing into or for flashing into other TI processes? Okay, so the question is, uh, how have we instantiated this? Is it ROM only, or do we also provide the source code for flashing into other TI processors? At this point, it's ROM only. Okay, we don't provide the source code uh, to anybody at this time. Now, I'll throw that in there because, you know, with any IP or any proprietary technology, how long is it going to be before somebody else figures it out or does something that's comparable? But at least as of right now, we are the only people that have anything that can do what this can do with motors. And as a result of that, we've decided to be perhaps uh, conservatively cautious on how we protect that IP. So right now, there's, there's no instantiation of this outside of the ROM. In fact, even some of the simulation stuff that, that I'm going to be coming up with and introducing, introducing on VisSim, it's going to actually, the simulation will interface to a target board, a target 69 card, and actually exercise the code in ROM and then feed the results back for the rest of the simulation. And that's how we'll be able to simulate it in the loop. But other than, maybe a simple way to say it is right now there is no, absolutely no instantiation of this anywhere, even in simulations, except in ROM. Okay? Yes? Yes. Full clock speed, exactly. Good point. Right. Ninety. Yeah. So we still haven't answered this question yet. So what are the launch pad? Obviously, is one. Can you think of another one? Uh, well, the control card is the, the, the CPU card, but what power board could it sit on? I guess that's what I'm looking for. The DRV8312 kit, I should just, just tell you, I guess. It's the 8312 kit, the 8301 kit, the high voltage board that we have, the high voltage kit, and then now most recently the launch pad. So we've got right now four development options for you, depending upon your motor and your particular application. Okay, so um, that's pretty much all I have. Um, I hope that FAST is something that, or I should say that InstaSpend FOC is something that you'll get a chance to take out for a test drive. Um, I think if you do motor control, you're going to find that this can, it's really easy to use and it really solves a lot of your questions. But what else can you do with InstaSpend FOC? Are there other ways that you could use this to your advantage? I just want to point out now, okay, just Hear me out. You know, Valentine Day, Valentine's Day is coming up here pretty fast, and maybe you're looking for that special gift, you know, for your wife or your girlfriend. You know, maybe she would be interested in going through some InstaSpin FOC stuff with you. 
You know, you could tell her what you've learned in this seminar, maybe give her a control card. You know, that might be something that uh, would be really special. Just, just, just saying, food for thought. I have not tried this with my wife, I just want you to know, okay? <laughs> but if anybody does do this, uh, write me an email and let me know how it goes, all right? Um, let, me, let me show you what this thing can do here. Uh, let me fire up the GUI interface and uh, we can actually watch this control uh, a motor here. <clears throat> uh, where is my GUI? Uh, everything's been rescaled because of this new resolution um, on the projector here. And I'm trying to find where my GUI is. Well, mm, 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 mm. oh, here it is. It's hidden down here now. So what I'm going to do is I've got this little DRV8312 board. In fact, maybe what we could do now is bring the lights up because I'm not going to be using uh, too much of the screen anymore. Uh, most of it will be focused on, on what I'm doing right here. So bring it up at least so we can see the screen, you know, what's on the screen. But I really want, yeah, that, that's probably good enough. So I have this little DRV8312 board as shown right here. And right in the middle of this board is this tiny little chip right here. That's the DRV8312. It's actually got a 5 amp motor driver built into this thing. And that's what I'm going to be using to drive my motor here. Um, kind of an interesting application. This is a 230 volt um, HVAC motor uh, that I'm driving at 24 volts. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm going to have to go through and change some of the interrogation parameters uh, to learn this motor, but basically uh, it'll work just fine. Let me fire this up here um, and we'll see what happens. So now GUI Composer is launching. There we go. And it's loading the application. Downloading the code, restarting the model, all this kind of stuff. It kind of steps you through what it's doing at any particular moment in time. And there we go. So this is the GUI interface. And what we see right away is that there's this red light shown right here, which says the motor has not been identified yet. So we can't do any field-oriented control with it just yet. Um, so now in order to, um, in most cases, just leaving these to the default values here is good enough, but since I'm driving a 230 volt motor with 24 volts, I'm going to change one of these parameters. I'm going to change the current that it uses to uh, estimate the inductance to uh, 0.2 amps. Uh, 0.2, whoops, whoops, wait a minute, 0.2, there we go. Estimation frequency, 20 hertz, that looks good. Um, motor pole pairs, now oh, this is interesting. Let me show you this motor. Um, this is the rotor inside of the motor. And now it's got these three little magnetic bands on it. But each one of these uh, magnetic bands is divided up into four poles. So you have four times three, that's 12 poles. So if I want to know how many pole pairs that is, six. So I need to go ahead and put six in that column right there instead of four. Maximum motor current, uh, maximum frequency. I'm going to change that to, uh, let's say, 200. OK. That should work, I think. It is a PMSM motor. So now I'm going to say, go out and identify the motor. Now it's going to use the auto ID to go through a couple of steps. And I'll hold it up so you can see it. Right now you can feel the motor vibrating or buzzing as it's trying to go out and get the uh, resistance of the stator winding. And then uh, it starts spinning kind of rough, but then it starts getting the hang of it. And you can see as the motor is spinning, it's actually in real time updating its estimates of the parameters in that green block down there. 
actually it's got the resistance already defined. But now it's going to try to go through and find the inductance values. And there's a little progress bar at the top which shows you how, how it's going in terms of identifying this motor. So we're about half done. Now once this process is done for a particular motor, you don't need to do it again. I'm, j I'm just kind of showing you, you, know, how you how you would go through it for the first time for a particular motor. Okay. And it's done. Now the little light at the bottom says, yes, the motor has been identified. Kind of hard to see, but it said that it had stator resistance of 4.3 ohms. Both LSD and LSQ are equal to uh, 0.035 Henry's. And then it also did a flux estimation. Now they do the flux in volts per hertz. That's not a very standard way to do flux, but it, you know, it's kind of an easy way, I guess, to measure it. 0.6 volts per hertz is, is the, uh, is the uh, flux rating. Let's go now over to the speed torque tab, and this is where we can actually exercise the motor. We can change the, uh, you know, the acceleration. I think that's a little slow, the default value. I'm going to jack it up a little bit. But uh, I can set the motor speed to, let's say, you know, 100 uh, RPM. Again, since I only have 24 volts to deal with, I'm not going to be able to get the same kind of RPMs that I would if I had a, a 400 volt bus. But uh, let's go ahead and start this thing then. And what it will do, because I've enabled this option, it always will go out and, and do a resistance estimation before it starts moving. You can turn that off if you want to. But. So right now, it's going to spin up to speed. Okay, let me see if you can see that. I love this motor because the back bearing is strong enough to support it so that I can hold it open like this, and you can actually see what's going on inside of it. Uh, this motor has a bigger brother, which I used to use in my simulations and my, in my seminars. Unfortunately, it's in a Turkish prison right now. Um, they wouldn't let me get back on the plane with it when I was leaving Turkey. And uh, though I fought and argued, uh, they said, nope, you go to the gate, the motor stays here. The problem was I was taking the motor through security as two different pieces. I had the rotor separate. And as soon as the rotor glommed onto the side of the x-ray machine because of its magnet, they just freaked out. They said, no magnet on airplane. I'm like, what? I mean, your phone has a magnet in it. I mean, there's all kinds of things. No, no magnet on airplane. So it's, uh, it's over in Turkey somewhere. Um, you can set the gains of the, of the speed loop right here. Uh, in this case, I've got it tuned to like a 2. KP is 2, KI is 0.02. Um, let's see how slow we can make this thing go. I'm going to put it down to uh, 10 RPM. And I'll hold it up in just a second so you can see it. But one thing I've noticed is that when it gets down that slow in speed, um, it does kind of help to uh, tune the gain to be a little bit higher so we can get some better performance. I'm going to change the KP to 5. I think I'll change this to 0.1. And uh, so you can kind of see, you know, at, at 10 RPM, uh, we can still get pretty, pretty slow speeds on this. And, I mean, it's not a lot of torque, but, you know, I mean, you can, you can feel that this thing is still generating some torque. Uh, now, what's amazing, I think equally amazing about this demonstration is not only the algorithm and how it works, but this, this tiny little chip down here can actually control a motor that big and provide up to one newton meter of torque on this particular motor. Um, and if, if you come up here afterwards and you, I'll have it running, you can load the thing down and put your finger right on the chip, it's cool. Okay, it's running just like an icicle. Uh, doesn't heat up at all. It, it's rather interesting. I found out after the fact that that chip originally was not designed by our motor group. It was designed by our digital audio people. They were used to designing class D amplifiers. So they designed this thing to have a dead time of like five nanoseconds. And I was 
I'm blown away by that. I mean, yeah, it's great. I mean, I love feeding those kind of nice waveforms to my motor, but it's kind of like feeding caviar to a pig. I mean, the motor doesn't care that much about it, but see, they were thinking, no, no, we need to have pristine waveforms because we're like driving speakers or something. And this thing can go all the way up to uh, at least between zero and 200 kilohertz switching frequency. That chip is rated to work at 95% efficiency. It's amazing what that little chip can do. So again, if you're I mean, not only interested in the algorithm, but certainly that little DRV chip is, is quite amazing. So what I'm going to do, um, let me get some more, uh, well, let me bring the gains back down just a little bit. There we go. And I'm going to bring up the speed to like, uh, let's say, 50 RPM. And under that condition, at 50 RPM, I can, uh, I mean, I can generate quite a bit of torque on, on that motor. So, uh, and like I said, it's got a little torque readout right here. You can see in that case, I was putting well over like 1.2 newton meters of torque on the, on the motor. So that's pretty much it. Um, just again, wanted to make you aware that uh, this is what we have. Um, and you can easily get this by ordering an, a, a 69 control card with the F or the M part uh, suffix on it with a little DRV8312 chip or a DRV8301 board. Uh, we have lots of different options that this can work with. So um, I'll have this running up here at the end. You can come up and play with it. But I think, um, Adam, you want to come up now and talk a little bit about InstaSpin Motion and kind of take us through to the finish line here.